Well, I'm uh, Tony Heller, probably better known as Steve Goddard. And I'm going to be touching on um, some similar stuff to what Fred was just talking about, um, but from a slightly different angle. Um, and I'd like to start out saying that I, I completely agree with Fred that there probably has been little or no warming since the 1940s. And I'll go into detail about that um, and how I came to that conclusion. Let me start out just telling you a little bit about myself um, and what my background is that got me, in, got me to the point where I'm at, you know, studying this problem. Um, I have a bachelor's in geology and master's in electrical engineering. I worked for 20 years as a microprocessor designer designing for the most powerful microprocessors in the world, most recently the Intel i7. Um, I've done software and climate model development. Um, I've done the software part of it for the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, where I live. Uh, I worked as a research scientist at Los Alamos in Sandia. I did geo geothermal energy research at Los Alamos. Um, I worked on the safety analysis report for the Department of Energy's nuclear waste disposal project in New Mexico. In imaging systems for Defense Department and uh, commercial drones. And most recently this summer, I spent some time in Vermont to working on um, Google's virtual reality system. And currently, I'm working in Boulder on uh, remote surgical, doing the development for remote surgical equipment. So basically, my background is I've been on mission critical projects which require that everything is exactly right. And with the, with, the, with the temperature record and other climate temperature records from the government, I'd say it's the exact opposite. Everything is exactly wrong. A um, little more about myself. I'm a lifelong environmentalist. Um, I testified at my first congressional hearing in support of wilderness in 1972. I, I wasn't real old at the time. I worked as a volunteer wilderness ranger for the United States Forest Service. I'm a full-time cyclist. I hate driving. I, I, getting in a car is absolute misery for me. I tweet about cycling almost every day, and I promote mass transit. Um, and if, if I can't ride, I'll take a bus or a train to get to work. I have no ties to any, any energy company. And I have no funding other than small donations on my blog. Um, and I was a global warming true believer from 1980 till 2003. I was introduced to it by my boss at Los Alamos in 1980. And it sounded like a good idea, so <laughs> went along with it. Okay, so the methodology for all the data that I'm showing you here today, it's all from official sources. I use the same data from NOAA that NOAA uses in their graphs. And in other sources are NASA, IPCC, and NCAR. Um, I've done 10 years of very extensive research um, combing archives. Um, I'm also going to show you some historical records from newspapers. And I wrote, I'm, I'm a programmer now mostly, and um, I wrote a, some pretty extensive software to analyze the NOAA Global Historical Climatology Network um, daily and monthly temperature data. And I'm just going to show you this slide just to, to emphasize again um, that I'm an expert in, in quality. Um, I was given this award by IBM. Um, the PowerPC 604 RISC microprocessor made functional by Tony Debug God Heller. And it just the, the point about the, I'm bringing this up here is that I, I worked in an industry where everything has to be perfect when it goes to, to the fab. Um, if, if you design a microprocessor and it goes to fab, it has bugs in it, it costs the company millions or tens of millions of dollars. So I, I got a reputation as being the guy who assumed that everybody else's work was wrong and fleshed out every last detail in it. So bad news for the uh, climate guys that I came along and started looking at their stuff. <laughs> okay. So most people believe that hot weather is becoming more common and intense in the United States. And this belief is utter nonsense, as I'm about to show you. Um, it's in, uh, this is very good timing for this conference, because 80, 80 years ago this week was the worst heat wave in the history of the, of the United States. 
Um, I don't think this article, this headline is actually quite right, but it said, this was from July 1936, 12,000 dead in 86 cities from the heat wave. I think, that's, I think they made a little math error. This was actually 12,000 total deaths, but there were, there were probably about four or 5,000 actual heat wave deaths that, that week. And this day, uh, July 9th, which was 80 years ago today, was one of the hottest days in U.S. history. All of those stations marked in red were over 100 degrees, which is mind-blowing to imagine all, uh, all of the Midwest, um, all of the East Coast, everything except, except up into northern New England was over 100 degrees that day. July 9th, 1936, which was 80 years ago today, was the hottest day in New York City's history. It reached 106 degrees. And what this graph is, it shows you the hottest temperature um, of the year per year. So you can see that big peak in 1936. And generally, the hottest days in New York have declined since the 1930s. Um, same thing in uh, Long Branch, New Jersey, at 100 six degrees on this date 80 years ago, in the same pattern where the hottest temperatures have dropped off, uh, particularly since the late 1990s, rather sharply. Um, unbelievably, this week in 1936, South Dakota reached 120 degrees. Um, you know, remember a few weeks ago, they, they, they were hysterically warning that Phoenix may reach its hottest temperature ever, blah, 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 blah. You know? And it's all due to global warming and we're all going to die. And it's going to happen every week for the rest of your life. <laughs> well, it turned out Phoenix didn't hit 120 degrees. The hottest they got was 119. And actually, the, long, the worst heat wave Phoenix ever had was the year I started at Arizona State University. Was, it was in 1974, which is the peak of the global uh, cooling crisis. During June of 1974, Phoenix had 19 straight days over 110 degrees. I think that this year's heat wave only had like four, three or four days, of consecutive days over 110 degrees. So it didn't come close to the global cooling heat wave of 1974. <laughs> but, but what's interesting about this graph is how um, in the 1930s, the hottest temperatures were much hotter in South Dakota. You can see that big hump. And now they're only about, they're actually about 10 degrees cooler now than they were in the 1930s. This week in 1936, Seymour, Indiana reached 113 degrees. And these, these kind of temperatures are inconceivable now in places where 100 degrees is very, very rare anymore. Um, more than 20% of the U.S. all-time temperature records for this is at the uh, um, United States Historical Climatology Network stations. There's about 1,200 of them. Not all of them were active in 1936. In fact, quite a few of them weren't. But, uh, but about 20% of the, of the um, stations they have in their database set their all-time temperature record in 1936. You can see that there was an extreme spike then, which was totally unprecedented. OK, now let's go to Omaha, since that's where we are. Um, on July 4th, um, 1936, it hit 113 degrees in Omaha. As you can see, July 4th, this is a graph of July 4th temperatures per year. You can see July 4th have been getting cooler and are actually more than 10 degrees cooler now than they were in the 1930s. Um, the hottest daily maximum temperature of the year, you can see, was much hotter in the 1930s. With, with Omaha reaching 116 in 1934. And since more recently, they've, um, the last few years, they haven't even gotten up to 100. So temperatures, hottest days have dropped off rather sharply here. Um, Omaha used to have days over 110 degrees. Um, in 1934 and 1936, Omaha had seven days over 110 degrees. The last time they had 100, 10 degree day was in 1954 when there were four of them. There have been no 110 degree days in Omaha since 1954. Um, they used to have more days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. In 1934, there were um, 
It's like about 46 days, 40, yeah, 46 days over 100 degrees. The last few years, there have been none. So 100 degree days have become much less common here. Omaha used to have, used to have more days over 90 degrees. In, in 1934, there were 81 90 degree days. Last year, there were 16. It's dropped off rather sharp. And last year, if you remember, NASA says was the hottest year ever except for this year, which is even hotter, apparently. <laughs> um, the average summer, maximum summer temperature has also dropped off quite a bit. In the 1930s, it was up over 90 degrees. Now it's closer to 85 degrees. The hottest Jul July 9th, which is today in Omaha, was 105 degrees in 1930. And once again, you can see that July 9th temperatures have dropped off rather sharply in 1930. These numbers I'm showing you are all the official United States Historical Climatology Network station at Ashlands, which is about, I think, about 20 or 30 miles west of here and is the closest station to Omaha. And the hottest temperatures um, here in Omaha have also dropped off about 10 degrees since the 1930s. Okay, so now let's look at the, the record for the entire United States. Um, there were, the number of days, the percentage of days over 100 degrees took a huge spike in the 1930s and another one in the 1950s. Um, that, that big spike's in 1930s. In 1936, across the entire United States of the 1,200 USHCN stations, almost 5% of the days were over 100 degrees, which is pretty mind-boggling <laughs> to think about that. It's a phenomenal, um, some, something we can't conceive of today because we haven't seen anything like that. So there are big spikes in 1934, big spikes in 1936, big spike in 1954, and another big spike in 1980. 1980 was the last year where we really had a lot of 100 degree days in the United States. And I actually remember being stuck out on the tarmac at Dallas-Fort Worth for about three hours on a, the broken airplane and no air conditioning in July, and I thought we were, all, it was about 130, 120, 130 degrees inside the plane. Okay, now this graph is very important, and I'll refer back to it later. This is the aerial coverage of heat waves. This is the percentage of, sta of stations in the U.S. which got up to 100 degrees. You can see in, in 1936, almost 80% of the stations in the U.S. got up to 100 degrees. Now it's the number is typically closer to 40, and the last couple three years have been fairly low, closer to 30 percent of the stations got up to 100 degrees. And I'll refer back to this in a minute. And you'll see why this one is um, particularly important. Okay, and the, this is a U.S. EPA graph um, from their website, which shows something very similar. That the 1930s had big. This is their heat wave index. 1930s had these huge heat waves. We haven't had anything similar to that since then. Okay, but now the next graph is where we start to see trouble. Something's going wrong here. This is the next graph from that same EPA web page, which shows the area of the contiguous 48 states with unusually hot summer temperatures. And you can see something's wrong here. All of a sudden, they're showing that heat waves are getting worse in the United, that the area of, of the United States affected by heat waves is increasing. It is now higher than the 1930s. Um, and this directly contradicts their figure one, which shows that heat waves are much worse in the 1930s. So this, you know, you start looking at this sort of thing, you start getting suspicious that somebody is up to mischief. And they are. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to compare the, the two equivalent graphs here. On the left is the one, the left is my graph, which was taken from the United States Historical Climatology Network, showing the percent of stations to reach 100 degrees um, during a year. As you can see, it was much larger in the 1930s and has dropped off rather dramatically. And this, uh, and on the right, we have the EPA graph, which is based on NOAA's Climate Extremes Index, which is also based on the same data set that I used, the USHCN data. But they, they're showing this big increase, which doesn't exist in their data set. So what's up with that? Huh? Okay, so I'll, I'll, get, I'll address that in a minute here. 
So this is the current NOAA graph um, for the United States, and it shows about 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit warming since 1895. And this is the, the, there's from the, the same data set. This is from 1895 to 1987. You'll notice they show about two degree, almost two degrees Fahrenheit warming from 1895 to 1987. This is important because in 1989, NOAA put out a report saying there was no warming in the United States from 1895 to 1987. So somehow, after 1989, this warming, this 1895 to 1987 warming appeared. And I believe that Tom Carl, the current guy in charge of climate at NOAA, was, in, was involved in that 1989 report. So, um, the historical data has changed. The same data set, it's the same set of thermometers, the same person even working on the data, but they've suddenly, they've created this two degrees of warming during that time period, which didn't exist previously. Similarly, in 1999, James Hansen, the world's number one climate alarmist, said that the empirical evidence does not lend much support to the notion that the climate is headed precipitously towards more extreme heat and drought. In the United States, there's been little temperature change than in the past 50 years, the time of rapidly increasing greenhouse gases. In fact, there was a slight cooling throughout much of the country. So what happened to this cooling? You know, how, did the, how did things change? And just, okay, now I'm just going to digress a little bit and just poke a little fun at these guys. Um, so in 1986, Hansen said that the U.S. had warmed one to two degrees since 1958 and was going to increase three or four more degrees by the year 2020. So we better, I guess we're going to need to have a really big heat wave um, in the next few years in order to get up to three or four degrees by more by 2020. But we have a problem once again. In, in, Hansen's, in Hansen's 1999 graph on the right, he showed essentially no warming from 1958 to 1986. So I've, I've got that highlighted in yellow. Um, there, there may have been maybe a tenth of a degree warming. So why did he tell people in 1986 that temperatures had risen one to two degrees from 1958 to 1986? I don't know. And now just poking a little more fun at him. Um, in, in 2008, Hansen said that the Arctic would be ice free between 2013 and 2018. And Representative Markey from Massachusetts said he was right. He's a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> And which is probably true, except they spelled the word profit wrong, P-R-O-F-I-T. <laughs> he has made quite a bit of money off this. And of course, Al Gore, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, told us that the Arctic would be ice-free by 2014. <laughs> um, and this is a satellite picture from a few days ago, taken directly over the North Pole. It looks like there's actually quite a bit of ice in the Arctic right now. So I'm, I'm not convinced that Hansen and Gore were correct with their predictions. <laughs> of course, I'm, I may not be qualified to see what, know what ice actually looks like. <laughs> and Al Gore also says that the interior of the Earth is several million degrees, which, which could be problematic for people doing fracking. I, I, I would think... <laughs> I would think that would be very difficult on drilling equipment. <laughs> um, Jim Hansen also predicted that Lower Manhattan would be underwater by 2008, and that uh, the, West, the West Side Highway will be underwater, and there will be tape across the windows because of the high winds, and the birds will, won't be there. <laughs> So I was in Manhattan recently, and it didn't look to me like, I didn't see any windows taped up, and I didn't notice any highways underwater. <laughs> okay, so now we'll get back into the, uh, the meat of what's going on here. 
Um, you may recognize this graph. Um, Ted Cruz used it in a Senate hearing recently. Um, the blue line is the actual average um, U.S. Historical Climatology Network data per year. I mean, I just, NOAA publishes their raw and adjusted data, which they call final. Um, and so the, what this is is just a straight up average of all their monthly data from the raw data set in blue and the red data set in, uh, the final data set in red. And as you can see, the raw data set shows that there's actually been no warming. It's actually the, the warmest decade in the U.S. was the 1930s and temperatures have cooled off. But by adjusting the data, they've created the entire temperature trend, which doesn't actually exist in the thermometer data, which is very convenient when you're trying to promote global warming to adjust the data to match your theory. I think Einstein made a joke about that one. So, so this next graph shows the total adjustments. It's the difference between the raw and final, uh, or actually between final and raw UHCN data sets. You can see they've created a hockey stick of adjustments, which essentially accounts for the entire warming trend. The older data, they, they, they subtracted a, a little more than one degree Fahrenheit from, and the newer data, they're now adding about 0 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit onto it. So once again, the, the whole trend, the whole warming trend in the United States is completely fake. And this really gets into something which Fred touched on, which is the loss of stations. And since 1990, for some reason, there's been this um, huge loss of station data um, at, in the United States Historical Climatology Network. They used to get data from about 90 uh, almost 90% of the stations now, almost half their data is fake. And what I mean by fake is, if they don't get station data for a particular month from a particular station, what they do is they just make up the data based on models, you know, homogenize, they homogenize it in from stations that are, you know, within 50 miles or so, and create a fake temperature. And so now almost half of their station data is, is fake at this point. Um, and I don't really have a good explanation. Particularly notice, like, in, just since 2013, there's been a huge increase in, the, in their data loss. I don't know what the explanation for that is. But it's easy to detect because they mark it with an E in their database. <laughs> okay, so now this, this is where it really gets, starts to get really interesting. So the blue line shows the actual um, measured they, this, actually, this actually their, um, I believe their adjusted data is, but not um, homogenized data in the blue line. The red line is their, is their fake data, is the adjusted data. So the, the entire warming trend since 1990 is just due to them making up stations, making up station data which doesn't actually exist, which is pretty uh, stunning to me. Okay, and so I have a theory about what's going on here. Um, this is just, this is a plot from the National Weather Service showing difference between nighttime temperatures in Phoenix and in outlying areas in Maricopa County outside of Phoenix, showing the massive urban heat island effect they have um, in, in Phoenix, where the downtown areas are almost you know, 10 degrees warmer than the urban air, than the um, rural areas outside just due to the urban heat island effect, which Fred was talking about. So I, I believe that what's happening, and, and just, this is mostly anecdotal, but I've just looked through, you know, which stations are missing. It looks to me like they are losing a lot of rural data and homogenizing in um, warmer urban data. So they're so that they're creating all these urban stations which don't exist, and so when they lose the rural data, the, uh, you know, the urban data gets re replaced with it, and it's created the warming trend since 1990. Okay, so this, this slide is, is, is the one that really stuns me. This shows the, remember I showed you that a hockey stick graph of their adjustments? This plots it versus atmospheric CO2. It's, a, it's almost a perfect match. They're adjusting data almost exactly in uh, proportion to the increase in atmospheric CO2, which is the ultimate example of confirmation. 
bias. They're, they're adjusting the data to match their theory precisely within R squared of 0.985. <laughs> When, when I first saw this, I was just absolutely blown away. <laughs> I said, you can't do that. <laughs> okay, so uh, now just going to digress again for a second. This, this is one of my favorite articles from the Brisbane Courier in Australia from 1871, titled Imaginary Changes of Climate. A plentiful crop of speculation from weather prophets and projectors and half-instructed meteorologists and all the philosophic tribe of Laputa in general to whom the periodical press now affords such fatal facilities. Every season is sure to be extraordinary, almost every month one of the driest or wettest or windiest, coldest or hottest ever known. Much observation which ought to correct a tendency to exaggerate seems in some minds to rather a tendency to increase it. So the, you know, this, this climate change thing's been, and people have been imagining this forever. Um, in fact, there was a, a famous debate between Thomas Jefferson and Noah Webster. Thomas Jefferson was a big believer in um, global warming. He was sure that things had warmed up quite a bit since he was a kid. And Noah Webster convinced him that he was just seeing an urban heat island effect, that they had cut down a lot of um, forest turned it into farmland, and so yes, the snows were melting earlier just because the forest wasn't there. And Noah won the debate, Jefferson admitted, Webster won the debate, and um, Jefferson admitted that he was wrong about his theory. Okay, so what about global temperatures? Um, current NASA graphs show pretty much that this is the land only data. I think Fred showed a graph of land and ocean earlier. So this one's slightly different. The current NASA graphs show a steady increase since 1880 with a slight plateau from 1940 to 1970. And this is basically the blade of the hockey stick right here. But in 1974, the National Center for Atmospheric Research showed something completely different. They showed no temperature increase from 1870 to 1970. They showed a big spike around 1940. And most importantly, they showed a very large cooling from 1940 to 1970. Um, the, the, one on the, the, the one on the left um, is I, I got from a newspaper, and if you notice it below it, it says Source National Center for Atmospheric Research. The one on the right was published in um, Newsweek in 1974 when they were talking about how climate scientists were very worried about the coming ice age and they wanted to melt the polar ice caps in order to save us from global, global cooling killing us all. Okay, in 1975, the National Academy of Sciences published a very similar graph showing no net warming from 1900 to 1970, a large spike in the late 1930s, and a strong cooling trend from 1940 to 1970. Okay, National Geographic in 1976, I believe, showed the same thing. They showed no warming from 1880 to 1976. They showed a big spike in the late 1930s and a strong cooling trend from 1940 to 1970s. And in 1974, the U.S. National Science Board said, during the last 20 to 30 years, world temperature has fallen irregularly at first, but more sharply over the last decade. Okay, in 1961, there was unanimous, con the New York Times reported unanimous consensus of climate change specialists that it, th it's getting colder. In 1978, the New York Times uh, reported an international team of specialists finds no end in sight to the 30-year cooling trend in the Northern Hemisphere. And in 1975, NOAA said, this article, one thing is indisputable, the world has been cooling off since World War II. And Dr. Murray Mitchell from NOAA said that it cooled about half a degree Celsius, and the cooling began around World War II. So there wasn't any question at the time that the world was cooling from 1940 to 1970. So where is it? Where is the cooling? 
NASA has erased this cooling, which everybody knew. There was unanimous consensus of scientists, every single scientific agency, every single graph, every single newspaper article showed this dramatic cooling from 1940 to 1970. But it no longer exists in the NASA's temperature record. They just, they erased it. In this graph, I overlaid the 1974 NCAR graph on the current NASA graph. And the, this is the same data set, it's the surface temperature record. You can see how NASA has complete, er, completely erased this 1940 to 1970 cooling. And this is very important, uh, and I'll get back to that in a minute, why this was such an important thing for them to do. And I'm going to digress again for a second. Um, just, just something to show that um, the 1940 temperature spike was, was real. In 1939, sci the scientists were saying all the glaciers of eastern Greenland are rapidly melting. It, it may, without exaggeration, be said that the glaciers, like those in Norway, face the possibility of catastrophic collapse. So there was a very warm period around that time. I've got hundreds or thousands of newspaper articles from that time talking about glaciers melting, Arctic's going to melt, all the ice is going to be gone, we're all going to drown. Um, this is an article from 1958. Um, some scientists say the polar ice cap is 40% thinner and 12% less, and that even within the lifetime of our children, the Arctic Ocean may open, enabling ships to sail over the North Pole. So that, was, that would have been probably in the 70s or 80s, the North Pole would have been ice free, which was actually the Ice Age scare. Okay, so now we're gonna look at, this is, I plotted at the same scale the progression of how NASA has tampered with their data. The black graph on top is Hansen's uh, 1981 paper. Um, the, red, the blue line is, is NASA 1997 and the red line is NASA 2015. You can see how they successively cooled the past and make the present warmer. I don't really know how, you know, maybe they sent someone back in time to take new readings, historical readings. But it's the same data set, so how does the past get cooler? And you can see how they've progressively eliminated the 19... Uh, 40 to 1970 cooling. Hansen had already eliminated quite a bit of it by 1981, but he progressively eliminated more and more of it by 2015, and now that they've completely erased the whole 1940 spike and the 1940 to 1970 cooling. And even since the IPCC report in 1990, um, NASA has produced quite a bit of increase in recent temperatures. So there, some, somebody's having fun over there tampering with data. Okay, so now I'm going to tie this into our, our friend Michael Mann and his hockey stick. Okay, so this is similar to the graph that Fred showed. Um, this is from the 1990 IPCC report. It showed a, a very warm medieval warm period, a little bit of warming since the late 19th century, and then. It, flattened off and um, you know, hadn't been much warming since then. Hansen himself made a very similar graph in the 1980s uh, based on temperatures in central England, white, uh, white limp, might mountains of California, and isotope measurements from Greenland, which showed a very warm medieval warm period, uh, little ice age, and then it hadn't warmed back up to the temperatures of the medieval warm period yet. And remember, this is James Hansen who wrote this. This is almost identical to the one from the IPCC report in 1990, which has come under some criticism. Okay, but now in, in the 2000 report, as Fred mentioned, we now we have the hockey stick, the MWP's gone, the uh, little ice age is gone, and now we just have this um, very strong hockey stick. I meant to put in Catherine Hayhoe's hockey stick, but I forgot. That one shows like temperatures going up to like, I don't know, like 400 degrees in the next 20 years or something. Okay, so now I'll get back to uh, hiding the decline. This is uh, Steve McIntyre's graph showing um, what um, was erased from Briffa's uh, tree ring proxy record, all the, the red stuff. Was, was erased, and his justification for erasing it was that it didn't match the surface temperature record, right? 
And this is important because the surface temperature record had already erased that. It originally existed in the surface temperature record. So they erased, they erased the 1940-1970 cooling in the surface temperature record and then used the fake surface temperature record as an excuse to erase the proxy data. And this is, to me, this is pretty stunning when I realize this. It's like they, they, took a, they took a bogus surface temperature record and used it as an excuse to make a bogus proxy data record. So that is the basis of the hockey stick is whatever they did to get rid of the 1940s warm period. In this climate gate email is one of my favorite where Tom Wigley wrote to Phil Jones, it would be good to remove at least part of the 1940s blip, but we're still left with why the blip? So they wanted to, um, they wanted to erase the blip, but they didn't actually have any reason for doing it. So they decided to go ahead and erase it and see if they came up with an explanation for doing it later apparently. Okay, so now I'm going to um, uh, switch gears a little bit, jump to one, another one of my favorites, which was um, Antarctica. So in, in, in 2004, Gavin Schmidt, who's replaced um, uh, Hansen as the number one data abuser at NASA, report, <laughs> reported that um, Surface temperatures in Antarctica decreased significantly over, mat, over most of, Ant of Antarctica over re in, during recent decades, right? And in 2005, NASA put out this map showing the, that essentially all of Antarctica had cooled rather significantly. They showed some warming in the water around the Antarctic Peninsula in West Antarctica. But for the most part, the Antarctica had cooled rather dramatically. And this was based largely on Gavin Schmidt's work. But then, magically, that cooling turned into warming. <laughs> So by 2007, they were already turning that cooling trend into warming. The middle graph is the, is the NASA 2007 graph. And then by 2009, we had, uh, they, they had completely turned the whole olive continent, all of Antarctica red hot and obviously boiling temperatures down there. So they, they just seem, they seem to have the ability, they seem to have the ability to just adjust data any way they want to suit their current purposes. And um, in 2004, Britain's chief scientist, Sir David King, predicted so that we, we were all going to have to move to Antarctica because it was going to get too hot everywhere. <laughs> I, th I think I checked the other day. I think temperatures in the interior of Antarctica were like a hun minus 110 degrees. So. In 2008, um, climate study predicted that refugees will be fleeing to Antarctica. So all you people, people who go down to Arizona for the winter, don't do that anymore. Go to Antarctica. That's the place to go. <laughs> it's the only safe place to avoid the heat. <laughs> okay, and um, now I'm just going to throw in a little bit of stuff about, uh, it's not just the temperature data. NASA has done exactly the same thing with their sea level data. These are plotted at the same scale. This is 1982 Gornet's paper. And in the blue is their current NASA um, tide gauge graph. They've, they've doubled the amount of sea level rise from 1880 to 1980 just by altering the data. Same data set, you know, just suits their purposes better now. Hansen himself um, did a sea level study in 1983, which shows about half as much sea level rise to 1880 to 1980 as NASA shows now. Same Earth, same set of data. They just some, somehow altered it to, uh, to, to double the amount of sea level rise. Okay, in, in 1982, NASA said that sea level rise was about um, one millimeter per year. NASA currently says it's 3.4 millimeters per year. But if you go to the NOAA website, the, it's, the NOAA website still says 1.7 to 1.8 millimeters per year. So how did NASA come up with a number that's double what NOAA said for sea level rise? You know, this is top scientists, top science from our top scientists here doing this work. And in the 1990 IPCC report, it said there is no convincing evidence of an acceleration in global sea level rise during the 20th century. 
Now, of course, they, NASA claims that there's this huge acceleration in global sea level rise during that period. So I guess people, maybe in 1990, people were just weren't smart enough to read a ruler or something like that. Tide gauges like this one in Manhattan show that there has been no acceleration in sea level rise. So, like the sea level rise in lower Manhattan has been about 2.8 millimeters per year since they first started taking measurements in the 1850s. If you actually notice that the last six years, sea level's actually fallen there. Um, Rolling Stone magazine just did a huge story about Manhattan's gonna drown, we're gonna have to evacuate everybody, and it's all the stupid Republicans' fault. So, so I've been having a lot of fun posting comments on that one. And then, of course, um, the greenhouse, in 1986, we were told that the greenhouse effect could destroy all life. I, I was actually the, under the impression that, green, that life didn't exist without greenhouse gases. But, but uh, within a few decades of 1986, floods, drought, human misery, and eventual extinction of the human species, scientists warn. Science is grand, isn't it? So cl climate data is being manipulated to increase climate alarm using techniques that are unsupportable, would not be tolerated in the private sector. If anybody did this sort of stuff in the indus industries I've been working, they'd be called off, they'd be escorted out of the building and told never to come back. You just can't do stuff like these people are doing. Yeah, I just wanted to dedicate this, uh, my presentation to my good friend, uh, Dr. Bill Gray, who passed away several months ago. Um, he's a true inspiration and uh, a real hero. Um, Bill told me many times about how um, he, he received NOAA funding for his hurricane research every year until 1993. Uh, when Al Gore became vice president, and, and Al Gore invited him to attend um, a global warming meeting he was had, and Bill said, I'd be happy to come to it, but I want you need to know that I don't, I'm not particularly interested in your theories of global warming, that they're not, um, they're not valid. And Bill got his funding cut off right after that. Never got another penny out of Noah, undoubtedly due to him. You know, Bill was the greatest hurricane forecaster in the world. He's the guy who invented hurricane forecasting. Incredible tropical meteorologist. You know, he got his funding cut off because he didn't go along with Al Gore's um, uh, scam. And um, this is, so this is how, what happens, right? You either go, these scientists who work depend on government funding, they, they either go along with it or they get their funding cut off, you know, if, if, if people need, politicians need more warming, if they need more sea level rise, they create it for them. You know, Bill was incredible because he went through the entire last, um, you know, 30 so plus years of his life unfunded. He funded Phil Klotzbach, his uh, student himself, funded Amy, um, his secretary himself. You know, always maintain good spirits about it, and he refused to give in to the corruption which so many other scientists have gone into. So I just wanted to dedicate it to him because he was an incredible guy and a real inspiration to all of us, and I miss him terribly. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to say I'm probably one of several, or not many, subscribers or to, to your Real Science blog, and I really appreciate it. Uh, one thing has always intrigued me, and, and that was, how did you get, or how do you go back and get your newspaper articles? I mean, what, right. what, I mean, what, well, can you, what, what patented or methodology can you just right. tease us with that you're... Right. So the, one of the great things of the digital res revolution is that um, optical character recognition. So there's, there's several very good news sources where they've got off and they've um, scanned in all vast amounts of newspaper articles um, and, and done optical character recognition and you, can, and you can just search them digitally. 
So you just search for a keyword. So one of, one of my favorite sites is called newspapers.com. They have a massive collection of, so you have to pay for a subscription to get on there. Massive collection of stuff going back to the early 18th century. So you can just search through articles for words like global warming, global cooling, um, glaciers melting, you know, there's some of my favorites. Another one that's free is the government of Australia has essentially archived all of the historical newspapers called trove.gov.au, I believe. That one's a great one. They have a tremendous source. Um, New Zealand has done that. Paperspast.nz.gov. They have a lot of good articles. Uh, the New York Times has a lot of good articles, you know, very, very extensive collection. Of course, you have to have a subscription for that. Chicago Tribune has a free search. Uh, you can do it for free. Google News, now Google is a really interesting story. Google also has a huge collection of papers, which you used to be able to search by year, by date, but they broke that feature about three or four years ago and have never fixed it. And I'm suspicious that there's some sort of financial or political reason why they did that. They keep saying they're going to fix it. But they shouldn't. I'm, I'm, you know, as a programmer, I imagine they could probably fix it in five minutes if they wanted to, but they don't want to. You can search their archives, their newspaper archives, but you can't search it by date, which makes it kind of worthless because you always you always get real heavy top ended with recent articles. And it's very very hard to find the older articles in there. But that's that's basically the methodology. So it's pretty straightforward. I just. I, you know, anybody can learn how to do it in, in an hour. But it's a lot of fun to just dig up all kinds. Of, you know, I've learned unbelievable amounts of stuff using those search engines. Uh, Dr. Singer, yeah. how's it going? Uh, at the beginning of your talk, you said that you were an alarmist from 1980 to 2003. Yes. What happened in 2003? OK, so. Um, a couple of things happened. <laughs> um, I, I think the main one was I was I was over um, well, I was working over in England, and I had totally bought a, you know I I I worked a lot in England during the 1990s, and I, I lived in England when I was a child, and in the 1990s I was traveling a lot over there, and there was no question that England had gotten much warmer in the 1990s than it was in the 1960s and 1970s. Just intrigued by the fact that you mentioned this specific date. Right, right. So, okay, so, okay, so there had been, I hadn't seen any snow in England for years. I was in London, and I was taking the train back out to Cambridge. It was Robbie Burns' night in February. Taking the train back out to Cambridge, and we got the train got stuck in the snow outside of Cambridge for about an hour. They had a huge blizzard. The M11 between Cambridge and London turned into a huge parking lot. And so I started thinking about, well, this isn't supposed to be happening. Snow is supposed to be a thing of the past. It's supposed to be getting. And then we and and we, and I was living in Colorado at the time. We had a terrible drought and around 2003. We had a huge snowstorm. Then we started coming out of the drought, and I started realizing that what we were seeing was not linear. It was cyclical. And that was when I started getting suspicious that this was not due to carbon dioxide, whatever we'd been seeing in the 1990s. My second question is, yeah. do you have any idea at all why NOAA, NOAA's Climate Center in Asheville, uh, changed the number, of, uh, reduced the number of reporting stations so suddenly and drastically in the mid-90s? I don't know, Fred. Uh, that, uh, that's a question that we definitely I need to get I can't find answered. out. I've written yeah. to them and they don't answer. But I, I think it's had a huge influence. It's on, frustrating. Yeah. Uh, one more remark, if I may. Uh, you report on many adjustments of data by NOAA. That's all correct. Uh, I would suggest that you date all of these slides so we know when these adjustments were made. And I also want to point out that adjustments are never made to satellite readings. Corrections, yes, but no adjustments. There's nothing arbitrary about the satellites. You can't do that. You have two independent groups working to reduce the data. 
that come out of the atmosphere to the satellite and turn them into temperatures. And they keep each other honest. Plus the balloon data from radio zones. So you have various ways of making sure that the atmospheric data are sound. And that's why I tend to believe the atmospheric data rather than the surface data. And as you said, Fred, you know, when you guys said global warming occurs in the atmosphere. You've confirmed all of that. Yeah, global warming occurs in the atmosphere, not in parking lots. <laughs> one of my favorite thermometers is the one at uh, Colorado State University in Fort Collins, which started out 80 years ago, was in the middle of a farm, and now it's in the middle of a parking lot. And, 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 and Fort Collins was about 20,000 people 80 years ago, now it's about 150,000. And for some reason, the temperature has gone up at that thermometer. I, I can't imagine what it is. <laughs> okay, I, I'd like to make a comment, and I think this quote from George Orwell in, uh, from the book 1984 is so <laughs> apropos to what you've been talking about. He who controls the past controls the future, he who controls the present controls the past. Exactly. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, the website I'm using now is realclimatescience.com. Um, I, I actually spend, I spend actually a lot more time on Twitter now than I do on the blog. The, the reason being that I reach a lot more people on Twitter than I can on the blog. Like, I, I reach a huge number of people on Twitter, and I just feel like my time's better devoted there. What I do, what I'm doing now is I'm just posting the when I actually send that some data um, or a newspaper article I want to post, I put it on the blog. Um, and um, but if there is a subscribe thing on it, so if you go to realclimatescience.com and put type your email address into the subscribe thing, it will send you emails when I put up a new post. But Twitter these days has become much more effective way to communicate. Uh, it's Steve S. Goddard. So I have a lot of fun with that. <laughs> yeah, 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 Steve, yeah, Steve, Steve S. G O D D A R D. Right? Yeah, because I can get directly to Man and Hey Ho and all these people on Twitter and. And, you know, and I put, can put this stuff out in their faces all the time. <laughs> uh, that's cl close enough. Um, this is the first time, you're, you're fine. Uh, yeah, I'm in trouble. This is the first time I've been down to these meetings and this is fantastic. There's a, a lot of good, uh, very good knowledgeable uh, people here today. I've learned a lot, maybe too much, get myself in trouble. Um, but I've also had one thing uh, that I have noticed is the age of most of us in the room, which is a lot of years, a lot of young people in here, absolutely, all the way around. Uh, and I'm an auctioneer and I can talk for hours anyway, go from there. But how do we as a group get our younger generation involved in what we're doing? From each and every speaker here today, they have been absolutely fantastic. But we need uh, our younger generation, so I'm not speaking only to you, but to everyone else in the room. How do we get our younger generation, uh, Willie did right, he brought his kids with him, he's doing great. But there's a lot more kids out there we gotta reach, thank you. <laughs>